Arjun said, those devotees who thus earnest worship you and remain joined with you and those again who worship the imperishable and the unmanifested, which of these have the greater knowledge of yoga? Yoga. Chapter 12 is a very small chapter. The 12th and 15th chapters of the Gita are both chapters of only 20 verses each. They are very short. But just as much short they are, they are that much intense. Many people even know both the 12th and the 15th chapters by heart. But when many things get recited by heart, then there are a lot of difficulties. This is because when we chant them by heart, then we get the pride that we know them off by heart. This is a very big difficulty. Rather than that, it is better if one does not know it uh, off by heart. One person once went to a saint. The person asked the saint to give him wisdom. The saint told him, I can give you wisdom, but how prepared are you for it? The person said, I have memorized the whole Gita and I know all 700 verses by heart. The saint said, really? You know the entire Gita by heart? The person said, yes. The saint said, then there'll be a lot of difficulties. The person asked, why? How could there be difficulty? The saint said, you've memorized 700 verses from the Gita, but this just means that because you have learnt these 700 verses, you fell short of becoming Arjun. And because you fell short of becoming Arjun, you'll never be able to attain Sri Krishna. Only one who becomes Arjun attains Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna is not attained by just memorizing the Gita. The person asked the saint, why can I not become Arjun? The saint said that an egotism has come to you that you know the whole Gita off by heart. And because of that, you have lost the ability to become Arjun. And when you lose the ability to become Arjun, then at that moment, you have lost your ability to understand Sri Krishna. It is very important to be Arjun. You see that whenever something great is about to be said in the Gita, then it is because of Arjun's question. All we can say is that the love of the Supreme Soul is overflowing. It is one of these two things. Arjun is he who is natural and straightforward. Arjun asks about bhakti devotion in the 12th chapter. The name of this 12th chapter is Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of devotion. What is bhakti devotion? We may have this question. According to Sanskrit grammar, the word bhakti devotion is formed from two stems. The first is bhaja sevayam, worship and service. Bhaja yate, bhaja yate ananya iti bhakti. And the second is banjo amardane, literally to break all other relations apart from God. Bhakti devotion is formed out of these two. Leaving all other relations apart from God is bhakti devotion. A Hindi saint poet has said a very nice thing, Hari so jori sab so toryo. Tie bond with Hari, God, and break all other bonds. This order is very necessary. Many times we do it, but we do it in the complete opposite order. We talk a lot about breaking all other bonds, but we do not talk about tying a bond with Hari God. The saint says, Hari su jori saban so toryo. Tie a bond with Hari God, and break all other bonds. First, one becomes joined with the Supreme Soul, then afterwards by itself, all other relations get broken. And by breaking all other bonds, this means breaking one bonds of the material world. Apart from that, one has tied a bond with Hari God. One has remained joined with the truth of Hari in this, and the truth of God in this. Only then can bhakti devotion take place. Hari so jori, saban so toryo. Tie a bond with Hari, and break all the bonds, other bonds. I always say that bhakti devotion is a creative process. It is never a destructive process. It is an activity of creating. Just like you're seated in a boat to go from one shore to another, and the boat takes you there, when the opposite shore comes, then you have to climb onto that shore. And when we climb onto that shore, then we have to leave the boat. If a person says that this boat took me here and did not let me drown in the river, it has done so much for me, so why should I leave it? Yes, you would have to leave it, and only then will you be able to reach the other shore. While you do not leave that boat, bondages towards that boat arise. One has left the first shore, but one has become tied with the boat. When we perform bhakti devotion in the material world, then it is just like this. We become joined with Hari, God, and we find that shore, and then we break all other bonds. Hari so jori, saban so toryo. Tie a bond with Hari, God, and break all other bonds. By itself, the boat is released. We must also understand the word bhakti. It comes from the stem bhaja. We have looked at banjo 
Ahmad in there, breaking all our bonds, bonds, but we should also look at Baja Sevayam, worship and service. There are very many meanings of the stem Baja. If you take a Sanskrit dictionary and you want to find out how much research has been done in that dictionary, then just look at the stem Baja Sevayam. The stem Baja has been given so many different meanings that we can understand from this. It has many meanings. I have chosen 10 meanings and whenever I'm going to speak about this 12th chapter, then I always clarify these 10 meanings. This is because if these 10 meanings of Bajra are clear, then one will understand the 20 verses ahead of us. The very first meaning of the stem Bajra is to divide. Bajra means to divide. We have to do this in the world. We have to divide that which is useful and that which is useless. We have to dis divide that which is right and that which is wrong. We have to divide action and inaction. While a human being is not able to do this, then the human being will not be able to perform bhakti devotion. Bhaja means to divide. When anything comes to us, then it feels very nice at the time, but in reality, is it right? In reality, is it worth keeping? Is it really worth tying a bond with it? The Supreme Soul became pleased with a great saint. God told the saint to ask because he will give the saint Whatever the saint wants, because the saint has performed a lot of penances, and therefore God gave the saint a boon. The saint told God that, Lord, I do not want anything. He must be really understanding. When God is standing in front of you and says, ask what you want, and I will give it to you, and at that time we say, I do not want anything, then a very high level of understanding is necessary for this. It is very too easy to ask, but knowing that one can attain something, and yet not asking for it, is a very big understanding. And in, to attain God, one has to have this level of understanding. The saint told God that, Lord, I do not want anything. God began giving the saint options. He said, look, this is my sword. If you take this sword, then you will never be defeated in life. You will be able to win over the world. The saint folded his hands and said, no, Lord. God, if you are ready to give away this sword, then this means that you have no need for this sword. You do not need it, and that is why you are giving it to me, but I do not want it. If it was worth giving, then you would not give it to me. You are giving it to me because it is not worth keeping. I therefore do not want it. God said, it is not like that. I am very happy with you and that's why I am giving it to you. The saint said, no God, because I am yours, the whole world has become mine. The world would not become mine if I win over it with a sword. But I am your, because I am yours, the whole world will become mine. This is because I found out that the whole world is yours. I am yours and therefore the whole world is mine. God said, okay, just take this diamond ring of mine. If you wear this diamond ring, then all the wealth of the world will be yours. You will become endlessly wealthy. The saint said, God, do not put me into difficulties. I am fine how I am. I do not need it. God gave the saint a very long list and the saint kept saying, no, 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 no. God offered the saint extremely uh, beautiful celestial nymphs, which are beautiful women who would always remain young and beautiful. God said that they're endlessly beautiful and he will be able to keep enjoying them and despite this, his powers will not get eliminated. The saint said, they will remain young, but I will grow old, so why would I need them? I do not want them. The saint said no to the sword, the ring and the celestial nymphs. In the end, God insisted and said, I'm offering you many things and you do not want any of them, so come to my palace and take what you like. The saint went to God's palace and took a bunch of roses. The saint said, God, if you insist, then give me this bunch of roses. God found this strange. God said, you are remarkable. If you had not taken anything, that I, then I would have understood that you are a devotee without desires and do not want anything. But you said no to a sword, no to a diamond ring, and no to a celestial nymph. Then why did you choose this bunch of roses? If you had to take anything, then you should have taken from the three things that I offered earlier. What will you do with a bunch of roses? One rose will grow in the morning and at night it will wilt. It will not be permanent. Why do you say no to everything else to wish for this? The saint gave a very nice answer that, Lord, everything you have offered me is not permanent and therefore I have asked for this bunch of roses so that I can always remember the temporary nature of life. Every morning the roses will bloom and the evening they will wilt. When I see this wilt, wilting rose, then I remember that this life will also wilt and this life will also finish. If you gave me any of these other things that you offered, then my egotism would grow straight away. If I had victory over the world, all the wealth in the world 
or beautiful woman, then all of these things would add on my ego. But this bunch of roses that stay a whole day in the garden, stay nice and I'll take them to give me inspiration. They will remind me every day that this life will work and at the same time, I will not become sad because of this as every day the roses bloom, give everyone a nice fragrance and then wilt. These roses give me inspiration that life is temporary, but before we wilt, before we go, we should go having spread our nice fragrance. This will remind me of this. It will be a constant reminder to me. That is why I am accepting these. This is what you call to divide, which is the first meaning of bhaja. If it were us, then we would have been covetous of the sword, the ring of the celestial nymph. One who knows what to take and one who knows how to divide between right and wrong and between action and inaction, such a person can perform bhakti devotion. The second meaning of bhaja is to accept. One should accept. This is the perspective of a devotee. In other words, one can only become a devotee if one learns to accept in life. The majority of us do not accept and we make complaints. Whenever something happens and we say, why did this happen? Many people have this habit that when it's cold, then they say, it's very cold. When it is hot, then they say, it's very hot. It gets so hot at 11 a.m. in the morning. God says, here, I'll give you rain in the evening. Then this person keeps saying, oh no, how, now this rain has come. Something has to happen. This person cannot bear heat at 11 a.m. in the morning and cannot bear the pouring rain in the evening. When will this, what will then this person do? What does a devotee do? A devotee accepts. Accept it and enjoy it. In acceptance, one experiences the close presence of God. In complaining, one becomes far away from God. This is because whoever you are complaining about, you are far away from them and a distance is created between you and them. God gives pleasures and you accept pleasures. God gives pains and you accept pains. We will speak about this later in this chapter. I'm only giving you the principles. Bhaja means to accept. Third, Bhaja is to resort to and seek refuge in. In this life, we have to seek refuge in some person or the other. There is no getting out of this. We will have to make one person or the other big. Then it depends on who you make big. Do you make your neighbor big? Do you make the shopkeeper big? Or do you make a merchant in the market big? Or do you make a political leader big? Who do you make big? It depends on you, but you would have to accept seeking refuge in one person or the other. Why then do you not seek refuge in the Supreme Soul? Bhaja is to resort. Not only that, taking refuge does not mean going and talking to someone, but belonging to someone. And it is a psychological need. Each and every person feels that I belong to somebody, somebody is mine, and I am somebody's. This is a request of each and every person. Is there any person who has nobodies of theirs in the whole world? If this is the case, then it will be very difficult for them to live. Can there be a person who has nobody of theirs in the whole world? I am somebody's. The moment when we decide I am the Lord's, then this is bhakti devotion. Bhakti devotion is to resort to. Fourth, Vajra is to observe and to inspect. If you observe the material world, then you will not be able to go without having a vision of the Lord. We should observe the world, we just wander around the material world. We never observe the world. The Supreme Soul is in such small things. The Supreme Soul is blooming in a blooming flower. The Supreme Soul is rising in the rising sun. The Supreme Soul is shining in the coolness and the brightness of the moon. The waves that are coming in the sea are coming, that are the Supreme Soul coming to touch us. And when the Supreme Soul cannot touch us like this, the Supreme Soul has so much of a wish to touch us that it comes through the gusts of the wind to touch us. These are all God. Observe the world. There is a mystic system in place in the world. Apparently it feels as if it is all random, but if we observe the mystic system in place, then realize that it is all the Supreme Soul. Bhaja is to observe. Bhaja is to enjoy. A devotee is always pleased and merry. Many times when I look, then find it very strange that people have so much tension. They wake up in the morning and immediately begin running back and forth, back and forth. What are you so worried about so early in the morning? People even worry that they have to complete two prayer beads in the morning. Can people have tension because of this? It is as if they have two buckets of clothes left to wash. It is the same amount of tension they have when they have two prayer beads to complete in the morning. Bhaja is to enjoy. Many people ask me the question during my discourses that 
We are performing bhakti devotion. We are doing so much. We are doing so many prayer beads. We are doing so many types of jap, chanting the name of God, Mara. We read so many scriptures. We do so much worship. We do so much service. But is all of this okay? I'll tell them not to describe all of these things that they're doing. There is no need for them to describe all of this. One should never ask another person what, whether the, what they're doing in the name of bhakti devotion is okay or not. Just ask yourself, do I enjoy the thing that I'm doing? By enjoying, I'm not talking about the enjoyment of the sense organs or sense enjoyment. Do you get bliss from this? Do you feel enriched after every session with God? No matter how much you do, whether it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes or an hour, whatever you're doing, after doing it, do you feel that I have developed and advanced when compared to what I was like 30 minutes ago? I have gained something. I felt feel enriched. If you feel like this, then your bhakti, this bhakti devotion is true. If you sit for 30 minutes, an hour or for four hours and did not feel like anything, and when you get up, you feel that finally I've got up and I'll have to come back here at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, then this is wrong bhakti devotion. Then no matter if you recite the scriptures very clearly and properly look inside the scripture to see what you should do tomorrow, what clothes you should wear and what you should cook, if after four hours you get up and feel that finally I've got up, then this bhakti devotion is wrong. On the other hand, there is another state that when one gets up, they feel as if, when will I get to see my Lord again? If you feel like this, then this bhakti devotion is right. If you get up having performed worship for half an hour and your mind does not feel like going away and rather it feels as if you should sit there for 10 minutes more, then this is true bhakti devotion. After getting up, if you feel that I will go and see God in a few moments, I should go and see God for a few moments more, then this is true bhakti. If you have a rule of doing two Mara prayer beads a day and after completing the two Mara, you feel that I have to put up with completing two more Mara beads um, uh, to one side and I want to continue performing Jap chanting, then if you feel like this, then this Jap, the name chanting is true. But if you begin looking at the clock after one and a half prayer beads, then this prayer beads has no meaning. Bhaja is to enjoy. I will go even further and say that when we perform bhakti devotion, then we should enjoy this, and at the same time, the other person should enjoy this. And the majority of occasions, because of our bhakti devotion, other people get difficulties. We are performing bhakti, and a child or someone comes next to us, and we tell the child, Shh, go and sit somewhere else. The whole house is in tension when this person is performing bhakti. The person keeps telling some people not to go in one place, or other people not to go in another place. No. Bhaja is to enjoy. Fifth, Bhaja is to experience. I am describing bhakti devotion using words, but I know completely that bhakti is not a subject you can describe using words. It is a matter of experiencing. Bhaja is to experience. Just like love is a matter of experience, bhakti is a matter of experience. Bhaja is to wait upon. It is to wait. Radha is a symbol of waiting. Of course, Radha is the ed energy of delicateness and the energy of bliss. All of these things are accepted, but Radha is the attitude of waiting. She has no type of complaint. The songs that poets have written are fine in that they have complaints, but she who is Radha never complained. Waiting is bhakti devotion. If Sri Krishna comes, then she gets bliss. And if Sri Krishna does not come, then there is a bliss of waiting. There is a bliss even in waiting. Bhakti devotion is to wait upon. Patience is extremely necessary in bhakti devotion. Today in society, patience is reducing. People are becoming less and less patient. All the problems that we have today have arisen as a result of impatience. We have impatience in each and every matter. Children want to grow up quickly. Elders want to earn money quickly or want to enjoy the enjoyments quickly. There is impatience everywhere. There is impatience in tying relations and there is impatience in breaking relations. This impatience also comes in bhakti devotion. It comes in each and every place. True bhakti devotion is to wait upon. The eighth meaning of bhaja is to serve. This is where bhaja sevaya, worship and service comes from. It is being full of feelings. We are performing worship and this is a very good thing, but we should have a wish of going ahead of worship and to enter the field of service. There is a little difference between the two. Worship can become a little mechanical, whereas service has feelings. But on many occasions, service also becomes mechanical. 
If it does, then the very meaning of service has died. I always give the example that if a wise and knowledgeable saint has come to a house, then we worship the saint. We make the saint sit down, do chanlo, putting vermilion on their forehead, tie a garland around them, and we touch their feet. What have we done in all of this? We have worshipped the saint. But when the same person is at home every day, then the people in the house do not do chanlo, putting vermilion on their forehead, tie a garland around them, and touch their feet every day. When the person is, what, what, do, what the person in the house do is that they serve him, they worship him, then study from him, they perform penances for him, and all of this increases. We do as much as we can in order to reduce the amount of comfort for him. All the people near him, they do not have to be his blood relations, but those who are near to him, wherever there is this atmosphere for him, they serve him with the attitude that how can I be helpful for his progress? This is called service. Then there is no formality in this. If they do not do chanlo, putting word vermilion on his forehead, then this is fine. If they do not apply rice to his forehead, then this is alright. In the same way, one should serve the Supreme Soul. One should ask God that, Lord, how can I be of help to your work? This is service. Worship is a subject of erudition, whereas service is a subject of feelings. This is service. Bhaja is to serve. Ninth, Bhaja means to adore. I very much like the word in the Gujarati language that it is Ovari Javu, to adore. Moto Ovari Re Girdar Tamara Lat Kane. This is to Ovajaru, to adore. And last, Bhaja is to love. While a human being cannot love, then a human being will not be able to perform bhakti devotion. Bhakti devotion is nothing other than a deification of love. This is bhakti devotion. Bhakti devotion is the development of love to a higher plane. I always say during my Srimad Bhagavad discourses that a person went to Srimad Ramanujacharaji and asked him that, you teach me how to perform bhakti devotion. Srimad Ramanujacharaji said, I will certainly teach you, first answer one question of mine. Have you ever loved anyone? The person said, absolutely not. I have never fallen into such illusions. I just want to learn bhakti devotion. Ramanujacharaji said, just try to remember, you must have loved somebody before, like your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your wife, your friend or your children. You must have loved someone. The person said, no way. I have never fallen inside this web of love. I just want to learn bhakti. Raman Sharaji folded his hands to him and told him that I will not be able to teach this to you. If there is a stream of loving, love flowing inside you, then I can turn it into the direction of the Supreme Soul and this will be called bhakti. But if you are completely dry and empty of feelings, then how will I be able to teach it to you? Bhajja is to love. It is love and true love at that. I once read a very nice book that said that people nowadays do not love, they do mohabbat. This is what people in films do. What does mohabbat mean? At the root, is, it is an Urdu verb, mohabbat. A knowledgeable person in Sanskrit has said it very nicely that the word mohabbat is tied to the Sanskrit words Moha, lust, and rat, vow. I'm putting spiritual here at the side. The word Mohabat is tied to the Sanskrit words Moha, lust, and rat, vow. Moha means lust and rat means vow. Therefore, such a person has taken a vow of lust. From Moha, lust, and rat, vow comes Mohabat. Mohabat is different and love is different. That is why there is a lot of lust in society, but there is no love. People walk around having taken a vow of lust. Bhaja is to love. These are the meanings of the stem Bhaja. From the second chapter to the sixth chapter, the Supreme Soul spoke about the form of God that is Nirgun, without qualities. The Supreme Soul spoke about Nirgun, without qualities, and about formlessness. You see that in the second chapter, that from the 11th verse to the 30th verse, Sri Krishna spoke about the soul. In these verses, there is only the description of the soul. In the twentieth verse of chapter two, Sri Krishna says, "Ajo nitya shaspato ayam purano no han yate hanamana sharire." He is unborn, eternal, permanent, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. This is formlessness. Right up until the sixth chapter, the nirgun without qualities form was remembered. From the seventh to the eleventh chapter, the sagun, the form with qualities form was spoken about. Shri Krishna said in the 17th verse of the 9th chapter of the Gita that Pita aham asya jagato mata data pita maha I am the father of this world, the mother, the supporter and the grandchild. 
How sagun with qualities is this? The supreme soul is saying that I am the father of this whole world, the mother, the supporter, and the grandchild. This is completely sagun with qualities. After this happened, in the visual of the universal form, the supreme soul showed a completely sagun with qualities form. Arjun got into a bit of difficulty. In the first verse of the 12th chapter, Arjun asked God the question that those devotees who thus earnest worship you and remain joined with you, and those again who worship the imperishable and unmanifest, which of these have the greater knowledge of yoga? Arjun uses the word yoga vitama, meaning the greater knowledge of yoga. Yoga is straightforward and means to join. One who has knowledge of yoga is a yogi. Yoga vitaraha means great knowledge of yoga, and yoga vitama is the superlative meaning greater knowledge of yoga. Therefore, there are three words yoga to join, vit knowledge, and tama greater. The word tama greater is, for example, used in the word utmaha, the highest of the high. Arjun asks which of these two people had the greater knowledge of yoga. The first word used by Arjun in this word verse is eva, meaning in this way. What does he mean by in this way? In the last verse of the 11th chapter, God spoke about the devotees who attain him. Mat karmakrut, doing work for the Supreme Soul. Mat paramo, looking at the Supreme Soul as one's goal. Mat bhakta, worshipping the Supreme Soul. Sangmina varitaja, being free from attachment and Nirvai Sarva Bhuteshu, meaning in this way. It refers to the idea set forth in the immediately preceding verse. Evam iti atinaha shokena uttam artham param prashanti mat karmakrut iti adina. So it was referred in the previous verse. This is what Arjuna this is what Arjuna means. Arjuna is saying that God, those devotees who thus and then Arjuna gives the special qualities of such devotees. The first is Satat Yuktaha. Srimad Adi Shankaracharya writes in his commentary about Satat Yuktaha that it means those who unintermittently apply to God's work or works for God's sake. Nerayantar yena bhagwat karmado yatoke artha samyatiha santa prabhutaha. Such people are Satat Yuktaha. These people are perpetually engaged in God's work. In bhakti devotion, consistency is given a lot of importance. Not only in bhakti devotion but in everything, one who does work unintermittently achieves success. If one wishes to light a lamp, then we have kept oil in the lamp, but what a wick does is that it keeps the flow of oil intermittently going to the flame. And because there is an unintermittently supply of oil, the flame looks as if, as if it is unintermittently lit. Otherwise, scientists say that it looks as if there is only one flame, but it is not only one flame. One flame comes and goes, a second flame comes and goes, and then a third flame comes and goes. This flame keeps changing, and in the end, when the flame blows out, then this means that one, that one flame that was there has gone, and another flame has not, uh, not come, therefore we think that the flame has gone out. The one flame that we see in the lamp is not one flame, there are many flames. All these flames keep coming up and going, and go so quickly, that another flame immediately comes behind it, and we do not know the gap between the two flames. The reason for this is that the flow of oil, or ghee, clarified butter, is unintermittent. In the same way, Arjun is talking about those who are unintermittently joined with the Supreme Soul. Arjun then says, Ye bhakta tvam paribhasate, meaning, those who meditate on you. Ye bhakta ananya shadayana santa tvam yatha dashitam vishwarupam paribhasate dhyananti. Paribhasate is, is split into parita in a nice way and upasate, performing worship. Therefore, paribhasate meaning means those who perform worship in a nice way. The very meaning of the word upasana is split into upa, near, and asana, near. Arjun is therefore talking about those who stay near to God. But in what we do, they stay. In, what what do we do that they stay near God? Arjun uses the word parita in a nice way. This is the same way as if a woman with a husband is doing anything but always in service of a husband. Sometimes she uses her body to do work in service of a husband. Sometimes the husband is not there and she thinks about the husband in her mind. Sometimes she is serving the husband's relations such as her mother-in-law and father-in-law but her husband is playing in her mind. 
She wakes up early in the morning, and if the husband has to go out of town, then she makes lunch for a brother-in-law. But why does she do this? Because he is the brother of her husband. When the brother-in-law has to go to college at 7 a.m. in the morning, and wakes up early and comes back at 3 p.m., his sister-in-law has a worry about whether he has eaten enough. Therefore, the sister-in-law wakes up at 6 a.m. in the morning and makes a packed lunch for her brother-in-law so that he can take it to college. When his sister wakes up every morning at 6 a.m. to try and make him packed lunch, then after 15 days, one month or six months, the brother-in-law thinks that his sister-in-law has a soft corner for him. Oh stupid boy, there is no soft corner for you. You are the brother of a husband and that's why she's doing it for you. But when the brother-in-law believes that she is doing so much for him, she is not doing it for him. In fact, she is doing it for him but it is because he is a brother of a husband and that is why she's doing this. When she's making a lunchbox for a brother-in-law, then she's thinking about husband in her mind that he is the brother of my husband. In many such different ways, the wife serves a husband and the husband serves the wife. In the same way, whenever the devotee on the path of devotion is doing anything in the material world, whether he is literally singing in front of God and performing jap, chanting the name of God, or if he's sitting there sometimes and is performing the actions of the material world, for example, going to the office, he is always performing the service of God. This is Satata Yuktaha, being intermittently joined with God. And this is Paribhasate, performing worship in a nice way. Such a person is performing the duties of the material world and yet he is doing them for God. This is the level of the devotees of the Sagun Sakar, God with the form and qualities. Arjun says that the devotees, on the other hand, are those who worship the Akshad, imperishable, and the Anainagut, the unmanifested. Dr. Sarva Shadana Samyasta Sarva Karmanaha Yata Visheshitam Brahma Aksharam Nirvasa Sarvo Paritava Akkiram Akarma Gocharam. That's what it is. So, Srimad Adi Shankaraji gives the definition of Avya, unmanifest, as Akarna Gochara, meaning beyond the perception of the senses. This is Avyaka, unmanifested. The eyes cannot see it and the ears cannot hear it. Such is the level that such people have reached and they worship God in this way. Arjuna asks the Lord, which of the two have the greater knowledge of yoga? Regarding the question of Arjuna's relating to Yoga Vitamaha, the greater knowledge of yoga, Different commentators have given different meanings to this. Kesa Madhusudan Saraswatiji says he is trying to ask the Lord that, Lord, which of the two types of people on the path of spirituality are greater out of the two? Those who worship the Sagun Sakar, God with form and qualities, or those who worship the Nirgun Nirakar, the formless God without qualities? Geva Sadaka Shesta Ke Swayistam Pratish Krava Mira. Ramanuj Charji says that Arjun is asking, who reaches the goal that they have decided earlier? Kesva Sadhyam Pratishti Grama Minaha. This is because the ultimate reason why we perform bhakti devotion is because we wish to attain the Supreme Soul. Therefore, Arjun is asking which of these people reach their goal earlier. Shankaranaji says that Arjun is asking God, there are these two paths of the Sagun Sakar, God with form and qualities, and the Nirgun Nirakar, the formless God without qualities. Which of the, these two is the easiest from which to attain moksha, liberation? Tatra, Sukharnvidam, Shakchat, Moksha, Hetukim. Madhusudha Saraswatichi even goes further to say that Arjun is trying to ask the Supreme Soul that God, I, I know these two, which is the path that I have to prefer? I have two choices, worship of Sagun Sakar, God with the formal qualities, and worship of the Nirgun Nirakar, the formless God without qualities. So out of these on which path should I walk on? Kesham, Granam, Maya, Anusarinam. And Srimad Adi Shankaracharya says that Arjun is asking, Who is it that understands yoga better? Ke Atista Yoga Vida. Arjun asks the Lord, Which of these two have the greater knowledge of yoga? God gives the answer in the second verse. Arjun has asked a very important question about those who worship the Sagun Sakar, which is God with the four mid qualities and those who worship the Nirgun Nirakar, the formless God without qualities. Arjuna is telling God that he can see one thing in the world that, and that Shri Krishna himself has described from the second chapter to the sixth chapter where the importance of the Nirgun Nirakar, the formless God without qualities, were described. From the seventh chapter to the eleventh chapter, Shri Krishna increased the importance of the worship of the Sagun Sakar, God with the form and qualities. Arjuna is therefore asking, so which of the two paths should I go on? The, God, the Lord gives the answer in the second verse.